Hello everyone and welcome. I am Floyd Richman, the Music Area Coordinator at Tarleton State University. Today our topic is Virtual Ensembles Made Easy. Let's look at Virtual Ensembles in more detail. <laughs> The earliest virtual ensembles of note were created by composers like Eric Whitaker, who embraced the virtual ensemble as a vehicle for artistic expression. In fact, he won a Grammy for his work. In recent years, the quarantine due to the pandemic made in-person ensembles difficult, and many teachers began to turn to virtual ensembles to fill the gap and to enhance their curriculum. As of this writing, we believe that we will return to in-person ensembles this academic year, but there is still some uncertainty. So, having a good knowledge of the techniques required to create virtual ensembles will be useful. Even without quarantines, virtual ensembles provide useful musical experiences. Let's look at the process for recording virtual ensembles in more detail. In an article published in Southwest Musician in February of 2021, I propose these steps for creating virtual ensembles. Number one, select repertoire. Number two, create a scratch track. Number three, distribute music and scratch track. Number four, students practice, record, and upload audio and video. Number five, teacher performs quality check. Number six, teacher aligns, mixes, and masters audio. Number seven, teacher creates the visual elements. Number eight, teacher uploads the video. Let's take each of these topics separately. When selecting repertoire, it's important to remember the final destination of recorded music. If it's going into a learning management system where only students can see it, then there are few copyright considerations. If it's going into a social media site such as Facebook or YouTube, you will have to abide by their rules. The rules and policies of these companies change over time, so it would be wise to read their latest terms regarding the use of copyrighted material. A quick solution would be to use public domain materials for performance or to compose for or have your students compose for the ensembles. The scratch track is a recording which provides a framework and accompaniment for students to record their parts. Once student parts are recorded, you replace the scratch track with the actual accompaniment. Your decision about whether the scratch track contains the student parts will depend on where students are in their musical development and in their preparation for the piece. The scratch track should, however, communicate the essence of the piece musically and expressively. The rhythm should be clear so that students can move together. The harmonies should be supportive so students can find their notes. The dynamics, articulations, and stylistic elements should be as close to the final version as possible so students can use the scratch track as a model for their performance. If you are recording instruments, the scratch track may include a few tuning notes before starting. If you are recording vocals, you may wish to set the pitch so students are certain of their starting note. If students sing on the first note of the scratch track, a count off will be required. If the scratch track includes an introduction, that probably won't be necessary. Distributing music should include the musical notation, a recording of the piece if possible, and the scratch track. All common notation programs will export PDF versions of the music, which students can view even if they don't own the notation program. The recording of the piece will most likely be a YouTube link. The 
The scratch track will most likely be a compressed file such as an MP3 for easy distribution through email and other communications. One, two, three, one, ready, breathe, on, on. Students should record their audio and video using the best equipment possible. If the recordings occur in the school, it would be good to have a professional level microphone and camera, audio and video editing software, and a dedicated computer. If the recordings happen outside of school, the best approach would be to use the camera app of each student's phone. Modern phones provide a high level of quality for audio and video. System settings for the phone often permit the user to select even higher quality. Students should record in a quiet environment. Since you'll have the option to add reverb later, it's probably best if students provide a flat recording as might be made in a room with curtains and carpet rather than a live one as might be made in a room with hard floors or tile walls. Students would ideally turn off air conditioners, ceiling fans, and noisy appliances because these could collectively add noise to the recording. Once recorded, students can upload files to their learning management system or share using a file sharing service such as Dropbox, Google Drive, Microsoft OneDrive, or Apple's iCloud. The next step is a quality check. Teachers should listen to the submitted student files so they can determine if they are useful. If not, the teacher should decide if the student should re-record or, in the case of an essential part, if perhaps a first-year player should be called upon to play their part. Ideally, all parts from all students could be included, although it's perfectly permissible to turn down weak parts and to turn up strong parts. Any conductor would make similar efforts to balance parts when preparing a piece of music. In the next step, teacher aligns, mixes, and masters the downloaded audio. The teacher should download the audio files and add them to a professional level digital audio workstation program such as Logic or Pro Tools, although GarageBand or Audacity will do if they are all you have. The need for the submission of quality performances by students cannot be overstated. However, that said, there are a number of audio enhancements that should normally be added to any recording. First, equalization or EQ should be applied to each voice. This is the process whereby low, medium, and high frequencies are adjusted so that each voice has the best possible sound. Do, re, mi, mi, re, re, do, do, re, mi, mi, re, re, do, EQ can make a significant difference with vocals and guitars, but also with all musical instruments. Next, balance the parts. In a perfect world, all students would be heard equally as a part of the blend. You'll produce a better recording, however, by emphasizing stronger parts. Next, you'll want to pan the parts so that each instrument has a specific location in the mix. I will pan track 1 to the left and track 2 to the right. I'll put tracks 3 and 4 in the middle. Our ears use locational cues to make sense of the music we hear, so panning students to the location where they perform makes the recording more realistic. Next, reverb is often applied to make the music sound like it's being performed in a large space. Do, re, mi, mi, re, re, do. Do, re, mi, mi, re, re, do. Because many students record in small rooms in their home, you can't expect the same quality of sound as when performing in a professionally designed auditorium. Carefully crafted reverb will usually improve the sound of your recording. One final consideration is compression. If you are having trouble getting a part to be heard without having to turn the other parts down too low, the part may need compression. Do, re, mi, mi, re, re, do. Do, re, mi, mi, re, re, do. Compression turns down the loudest parts of the track so the softer parts may be turned up. This often helps achieve a good balance. Compression is typically applied early in the balance stage to soft tracks and also sometimes after everything else is done in case amplification caused by EQ or reverb created dynamic problems. These details are best done by an audio professional. Call BR549. Just kidding. <laughs> Any teacher should be able to handle these steps. The next step is that the teacher creates the visual elements. 
The teacher should load photos and or videos into a professional level video editing application and create the visual elements using the mixed audio as the soundtrack. Given the general complexity of creating video mixes, there are a few shortcuts that could be used. Any conferencing software could be used to record postage stamp sized video of students recording their parts while listening to the scratch track or the final mixed audio track. This permits creating a wall of performers in one pass. Now, an important note, this is for video recording only. You cannot record the audio tracks for students performing in this manner unless students happen to record themselves at the same time and send it to you. As of this writing, none of the popular conferencing programs can provide simultaneous recording of multiple tracks. Another important consideration is how many videos you can practically record at once. As it stands now, video conferencing software seems to be using a 7x7 grid to show participants. This limits the screen to 49 people who can be visible at once. If your ensemble is larger, you may wish to record video by sections in separate calls. That is, one call for sopranos, one for altos, tenors, and basses, and so on. Or you could group instrumental sections together, flutes, clarinets, and so on. These software programs typically have an option for recording the screen, so again, there's a simple way to get a large number of faces on screen at once. The next step is for the teacher to upload the video. Again, if the video is being uploaded to a learning management system where only students can see it, copyright is of minimum concern. If the video will be uploaded to YouTube, Facebook, or other social media, you will have to abide by their terms. Again, you are safest if you release public domain and original materials on social media. You should also, of course, have permissions to post student images. Each school district is likely to have specific policies as to how student images can be used, and it's critical to abide by those. In conclusion, ensembles are a wonderfully efficient method for building musicianship in our students. While the virtual ensemble is a recent development, it offers many of the same benefits of in-person ensembles. In both, students learn to listen to one another, to play together, to phrase notes together, to match styles and articulations, to execute dynamics together, to balance and blend. Whether virtual instruments are used to provide the only possible ensemble experience during a pandemic or to provide enhancements to music education in other times, they are approachable by students and faculty and are here to stay. I invite you to drop by and study the frames for the posters in more detail. If you have questions, please let me know. You may contact me at crichmond at tarleton.edu. Thank you very much. Apps dedicated to the process of creating videos for virtual ensembles such as acapella are useful. Typically in each of these apps, the steps are as follows. Run the app and create a new project. Select a template and click on each blank spot. After recording each track, add effects to each individual track. Continue until the project is complete. Share to the camera roll. Share to Facebook, YouTube, and similar services. Run the app and create a new project. The first thing I'll do is search for acapella. So I'm just going to click the acapella button here. I am going to tell it new project. Select a template into which you will record. I'm going to go with this trio template. Here I'm going to set the metronome to 3-4 time and 96 beats per minute. Next, move to the template and click on each blank spot for the video. If you're going to record a scratch track, record it first. You can replace it later when all the other audio has been recorded. I tap the panel I want to record into and press the record button. If I'm happy with that, I can go to the next panel. If I'm not, I can record it again. After recording each track, add effects to each individual track, such as EQ or reverb. Continue to click on each blank spot for video and record until the project is complete.
Let's see the acapella output. When the project is complete, it can be shared to the camera roll, and from there, it can be shared to Facebook, YouTube, and similar services. You may contact me at crichmond at tarleton.edu. Thank you very much.